Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former Merchant Mariner and an adjunct instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And welcome to this, What's Going On With Shipping, the Marco oh, no. edition. Well, I wanted to do a special episode here because I've gotten a lot of requests about it, about the recent visit of the CMA CGM Marco Polo to the East Coast of the United States. Uh, ship has garnered a lot of attention because of its size. And this is the vessel right here. This is from the CMA CGM group website, uh, which actually featured this. Uh, it was a big, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a, a, a massive press pool effort here by CMA CGM to do this. Now, CMA CGM is a French line uh, headquartered in France. Uh, it used to be the old French national line. Uh, it is a massive container line, uh, one of the biggest in the world. And the arrival of Marco Polo on the uh, east coast of Canada in the United States marks the biggest container ship to come in. Uh, if you look at this story that they put in here, 16,000 uh, TEUs, uh, making her the largest. Uh, she's part of a route here that we'll talk about in a second. This is the CGM's uh, Columbus Jacksonville uh, Jacks route, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in a second. The ship arrived in Nova Scotia on Monday, May 17th, and then began her trip down the East Coast. Uh, talked about it. It was covered 11 days, uh, everything from the port of Halifax on May 17th to the port of New York, New Jersey on May 20th, port of Virginia on May 23rd, Savannah on May 26th, and ended up at the port of Charleston on May 28th. I said before, she's following this Columbus Jacks route, and I'll show you this route. This route here, let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see it a little better. This is a worldwide route. It is not a circumnavigation route by any means. Uh, it basically covers from Halifax down, then across the uh, uh, Atlantic. As a matter of fact, uh, she is right now, right there off uh, the Azores. You'll see her right there. She is off the Azores, heading for the Suez Canal as we speak. Uh, this route, again, uh, will then take her through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, all the way through here into uh, uh, Port Kalang, which is uh, off of uh, Malaysia, through Singapore, uh, and then route up along uh, Vietnam, up to China, across the Pacific, into the Oakland, uh, Los Angeles area, and then back around again. So it is, it is a pretty long transit here. Uh, if you look uh, the the voyages here from China, out by the time she hits uh, Halifax, it's 31 days. From 31 days uh, to uh, Port Klang, which is which is again in Mala uh, Malaysia, you're adding another 45 days to that. And then by the time you get back uh, to uh, Yanatan, which is going to be its 132 day voyage, all told. So it, it is a, a massive voyage. If you think about it, that ship can, does that three times a year. Now, I will note that Yanatan right now is undergoing uh, a huge delays. Uh, lots of stories coming in right now about that because of the shutdown of the port due to COVID. Uh, and this is going to have huge repercussions in trade routes and delays coming in. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, this vessel in particular, and I won't really want to focus so much on, on, on that right now. Uh, I want to talk about that because one of the things, the other news source that came out today was the other, was this story on the reports from CMA, CGM on record profits, $2.1 billion in the first quarter. This is true of almost all container companies right now. They are just raking in the coal of money right now. Uh, absolutely uh, impressive. Uh, this is the Jacques Saad, one of the biggest vessels in the CMA, CGM fleet right there. Uh, but they are all raking in huge amounts of profits. If you go into the story right here, they talk about it. net profits, net profits of $2.1 billion. This is uh, compared to a profit of just $48 million in the first quarter of 2020. Remember, that but was, was, was COVID. So you're talking about a 2,000% increase right there. So you're seeing this huge markup. And this is one of the reasons why CMCGM is in a big vessel ordering spree right now. Uh, they're upgrading assets with 22 vessels ordered, including 12 powered by LNG. CMA is, is adopting the LNG power source. Uh, Maersk, for example, is not right now. They don't want to adopt it because they think it's just going to be a interim method. So instead, they want to do that. Uh, they're also creating an air freight service, CMA. So they're, they're divesting themselves into air, which is a, a really interesting story that they're doing. So we're going to see a lot of different stories here that come up. 
the other thing here is the technology of the ship. So this is a story from ship technology that talks about it. Uh, the vessel was uh, ordered uh, and delivered to the owner in September of 2012. Uh, came in, even though it says in the story, September 2012, they have delivered here in November 2012. But basically the fall of 2012, she was delivered. 16,000 TEU at the time, one of the biggest vessels in the world. She was shortly going to be eclipsed by the Maersk Triple E's that were coming out. Uh, the Triple E's, when they came out, were going to be 18,000 TEU vessels. So again, this vessel, which is getting huge amount of attention along the east coast of the United States, is nowhere near the size of the Maersk Triple E's, which came out in 2013. Ships like the Ever Given, which is still at anchor in the Great Bitter Lake, or the, the larger ships coming out now, these 24,000 box vessels that are coming out. So when you see this here, the story on ship technology, and again, I'll have this in the ship notes, this ship was built at Daewoo in Korea. Uh, again, she's going to be replaced by the Maersk in this. She's one of three ships ordered in this size that came out. Her maiden voyage came out of Ningbao, and she went on to the French Asian line, number one, which is basically uh, Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, which is a fairly typical route. Now she's on that new uh, uh, Columbus Jacks route that she's running. Uh, some of the details on her, uh, which I always find interesting, constructing details, uh, was constructed in parts. Uh, Daewood loves to do this. They build the ship in sections at smaller shipyards, and then they bring them to the larger shipyard to put them together. So imagine big, huge, almost take a look at this vessel and slice it. And then what they do is they bring those slices together, join them together. Uh, vessel can accommodate 27 crew capable of 25 knots, uh, 396 meters long. That's about 1,300 feet. So, you know, about 300 feet longer than an aircraft carrier. She has a, a Wartzilla low-speed diesel engine. These low-speed diesel engines are the way you power these large vessels. You'll see down here produces 80,000 kilowatts of power at 102 RPMs. Uh, enables smokeless operation of the engines. One of the things about these engines is, is the engine is directly connected to the shaft. There's no reduction gear. That means less things can go wrong. Also, these slow-speed diesels allow you to cut out the cylinders to do maintenance on them. So even though you only have one engine, in truth, you have basically all these cylinders. I think it's 14 cylinders for this one that you can basically cut out and do maintenance on. Uh, electronically controlled, it consumes 3% less fuel, 25% less lubricant oil. Always a big thing was, was lubricant oil on these vessels. Environment is always a big issue. She's probably burning low sulfur diesel fuel right now so that she's able to do it. Uh, she has all the bells and whistles here. So ballast water treatment, one of the big issues you have is as you load containers and offload, you have to take ballast on board. And there's much more precaution these days about pumping ballast water into coastal waters for fear of contaminants getting in there. So treating ballast water is, is, is a huge issue for it. So a, a very advanced vessel for her time. And again, this vessel now is, is, is 10 years old, 10 years old, but we're talking about her as if she's a brand new vessel coming in and she's getting all this attention. Uh, this is American Shipper Report. I had actually showed this in an earlier video. I think it's a great one. This is when she's coming into New York. But they talk about the scale of the vessel here and the size of her. I'm going to show a couple of videos here because I think these videos do a great job. So this first video here is showing her uh, becoming the biggest ship to dock. And it gives you a good uh, kind of drone view vision of the vessel. Uh, love these drone views. You get, you get a great imagery of it. Uh, overhead, seeing the containers stacked up on there, those container cranes that they're using to get the uh, material off. Uh, that's one of those type of container cranes that that ship in, in uh, Taiwan took out uh, recently, we saw with the Ugal uh, Durban. But you'll see all the containers stacked on board. It gives you an idea of, of the logistics of, of how difficult it is to coordinate these movements, seeing all those containers stacked up there. Uh, this is a, a beautiful view. I'm not sure where this uh, was, was filmed. This may be up in Halifax, uh, where this one was filmed, is where she's at. Uh, you can see her. She's just a behemoth of a ship, uh, just really massive. And again, nowhere near the, the biggest vessels uh, that we know of. Give you another view here. This is her. Uh, actually, where's the one I wanted to? Oh, there it is. This is uh, actually, I want to get one other one here for you. So I want to get this one here. This is her arriving in New York, New Jersey, going under the Bayonne Bridge. This bridge recently had to be raised 
uh, be, to, to accommodate vessels like the Marco Polo. You'll see here there's there, there's two issues you have when vessels go <laughs> into the harbors. There's obviously water depth. You have to have enough water underneath there, so that involves dredging. But the other one is a lot of infrastructure had been built and to accommodate vessels that were much smaller. So the air draft, the vessel, uh, the, the height of the vessel from the water line to its highest point is always an issue. And the Bayonne Bridge actually had to be lifted. And again, this, this cost is, is incurred by the citizens of the communities largely. Uh, it, it's, you know, these are taxes and costs that are incurred. But the benefit here is for everybody in the United States and particularly for these shipping companies, because now they get an economy of scale. Now they can bring over ships that are much bigger, carry more cargo, and that's more efficient for them. And so the cost sometimes is disproportionately put on the local communities where these ports are. New Jersey, which had to pay for the Bayonne Bridge, that should have been a federal in infrastructure program, in my opinion. Because again, this is a benefit, not just for the citizens of New Jersey, but for everybody who's gonna get cargo off this vessel, which is gonna be beyond the people of just New Jersey. I wanna come back to that one for a minute. I just like replay this one more time because one of the things I want you to notice is her coming in with the tugs. You'll see Moran tugs. So you see a tug right there backing, actually backing down. She's got a, a, a line on her. She's actually backing down the whole time, which is a, an amazing maneuver there by tugboats. Uh, always good. Tugboat drivers are some of the best. You'll see some tugs alongside there and tugs, you know, two on each side or probably be two on the other side, one on the stern there. So that's a lot of tugs uh, on a vessel. And again, one of the things that you're doing there is to prevent her, should she lose power, to be able to keep her under control. Those are at least, you know, we see four, there's probably two on the other side, six tugs. That's a lot of tugboats. But again, you want to be safe. You don't want to get one of these vessels stuck, lose control, and create havoc, as we saw with Ever Given in the Suez. But that also creates cost because those tugboats don't come cheap. Let's come on over to this other video here, show you another one. This is her coming into Savannah. This is a great time lapse. So Savannah is one of the biggest developing ports on the East Coast right now. A lot of money has been spent in Savannah to dredge it and to accommodate new vessels. And Savannah, because of its location, a very short voyage in from the sea buoy to the docks in Savannah, you have I-95, you have I-20, I believe it is, uh, right there. You have an airport, you have railhead lines. And so you can come in, obviously this is time-lapse, you do not sail this fast coming in uh, to ports, but it gives you an idea of how tight these areas are. There, there's very little margin of, of error here. You see them passing a dredge right there uh, coming in. So this is coming into Savannah right here. You'll see them come past the downtown area right there. There's some fuel areas there to the left and come under the bridge here. See how close they are. This is filmed from the bridge of, of the, uh, uh, of the Marco Polo. Very little air distance right there uh, coming in. You'll see them passing some of the silos there for some grain uh, coming off, some of the machinery. You'll see the container cranes up ahead. You see them right here. You see container ships up here. She's going to spin around here in a large area that's designed for this so that she can spin around. And then she'll start going backwards. She'll go in, in, in a stern here. You want to turn her around so she's ready to head out. So they'll now back her down stern here see some of the container cranes coming down on that evergreen vessel right there see these container cranes will be moving here a little bit getting in the position she's tying up right there you'll see containers moving in the yard right there and she's off to go and uh that gives you a quick idea of that voyage and then this last one is a great aerial view uh, of her at our last port which is in charleston uh, where she's in Charleston. A lot of issues going on in Charleston right now. If you hadn't been following, uh, there was a new uh, container terminal open there, but there's a labor strike going on regarding the terminal. Uh, issues over labor working in the terminals, uh, amount of cost there. But you'll see her coming in. There's a Hamburg Sud Line ship right there. But here is uh, Marco Polo right here being worked by four of these gantry cranes right here. The more gantry cranes you can get on them, the more cargo you can move, but you also need... Uh, containers, uh, movers down below. Depends on how many boxes you want to move. Now, she did not move very quickly through the ports on this voyage. This 11-day voyage was, was really meant to showcase the vessel. So they really weren't moving her as fast as usual. But also, they, the amount of cargo she has to move. Now, should also note something, too, about her. She is not a U.S.-flagged vessel. And that's an important thing about moving cargo along. If you go back over here, Let's pull her up right here. She's a Bahamian flag. 
So she flies the flag of Bahamas, which means that when she comes through these ports here, she comes from New York to Norfolk to Charleston, Savannah. She can't move cargo between those ports. She can offload and she can load, but she cannot load a car, a container in Norfolk or excuse me, like in New York, for example, and offload in Norfolk because she's not a Jones Act qualified vessel. She's not U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, U.S. operated, which really doesn't matter in this case because the vessel takes so long to go through there. And there's a lot of port handling charges on top of things. It is much more efficient to drive a container from New York down the savannah than to load it on a ship of this size and and move it and you'll see some of the stacks get wiped out here they get cleaned out and that's so new containers can go on board uh you have to be very uh, uh smart here there's entire groups that work ashore for these container companies that do nothing about but plan on where these containers are to be stowed to minimize the number of container moves every time you have to move a container to get at another container that's a wasted move ideally you want to take a container off put a container on that's the efficient movement if you have to shuffle containers around on the ship that's inefficient you're you're wasting time also, remember what just recently happened with Express Pearl. Uh, she had loaded some hazardous material, that container uh, where the hazardous material the nitric acid was in got basically was improperly loaded. She spilled that nitric acid and caused a fire on board the vessel. That vessel is a fraction of the size smaller than the Marco Polo. And should something similar happen to a vessel like Marco Polo, which we've seen happen, we've seen it happen uh, with, with uh, containers this size, could be a catastrophic loss of a vessel. So the CMA CGM Marco Polo is an amazing vessel. She's huge, but understand she is a decade behind of where container ships are in the world today. Uh, she is, is by no means as big. Uh, 16,000 boxes is impressive, but the newer ships are carrying 24,000 boxes. So a third bigger, a third bigger, much more larger, much more efficient at carrying goods. The limitations on bringing vessels like that into ports has to do with those factors I talked about before, air draft, water draft, and also the cranes here. The cranes have to be tall enough and long enough to handle those vessels, which we don't see in, in many of these ports. So wanted to give you that story on the CMA, CGM, Marco Polo. Uh, a lot of press was associated with this vessel's arrival. Uh, a lot of people were doing it. Uh, and CM, CGM had a, a contest going on with ship spotting to uh, win contests with it. Very smart public relations program by CMA, CGM, and uh, an amazing vessel. But again, all part of this larger network of how we get goods. And when you look at routes used by companies, you, you begin to understand that. Uh, you begin to see that. And, and again, this is a large, large operation, obviously. A vessel that takes a third of a year to basically go from the East Coast to the, or start in Yanatan, China, and wind up back in there uh, after, after two voyages is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, it, it's an amazing uh, voyage you see here, 133 days, uh, 17 port calls uh, is what she does with the vessel sailing weekly on this route. And you see the other vessels that are operating on this route right there for them. So big vessels, obviously, uh, uh, other vessels, big ones, the size of Marco Polo right here is the Alexander von Humboldt, basically, basically that same size, the Jules Verne, and of course the Marco Polo. Those are the three big vessels that we see operating on this route with some smaller ones on there too. So anyway, that's the Marco Polo. Uh, I'm Sal Mercagliano. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button so that other people will be informed about the video. Also hit the bell so that when new videos come out, you'll be informed if there's breaking news. I always try to put together a quick five, 10 minute video to let you know about things. And I also try to make these little features, especially on requests of people who want to know more about vessels that are involved in the maritime trade. So this is Sal signing off.